Good evening, and I want to share with you something interesting. Um, in a way, uh, I'm going to make a big confession here. Deuteronomy 11.26 says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. The word and in Hebrew is just a vav. And it's really the context that's going to determine, it's just, it's a conjunction, but it doesn't tell you if that conjunction is going to be and, or it's going to be nor, or or. Only the context will tell you that. And after, uh, especially those on our learning channel who have, uh, we've been studying the Torah portion, and for the last three weeks it keeps talking about the blessing and the curse, I think you'll understand why I choose to use the word or rather than and, because when it says, this day I put before you a blessing or a curse. In other words, uh, as the children of Israel entered the promised land, this is where God told them, you're going to enter the land. And it's going to be either a blessing or it's going to be a curse. It's going to be your choice. Now, in studying this, especially in uh, uh, Jewish uh, teachings, I finally began to understand something that was very difficult for me to understand. And I realized to understand it, I had to step off the evangelical reservation shortly. Now let me assure you, I have, I, I, you know, I still, I can still sign that doctrinal statement from Moody Bible Institute. I believe and will never uh, leave my belief in Jesus as the Son of God, my personal Savior, and the Bible is truly the inspired Word of God. But it was very difficult for me after 10 years of academic training. That was going through Bible college, going through seminary, and then working on a PhD for four years. Yeah, it took me four years. I had to get an extension. I just couldn't get it done in three. Um, and after all those years, you approach a slippery slope where you make a decision I can't answer so many things that I'm finding in Scripture with reason, at least in our natural understanding. So either I go down the slippery slope of what's called liberalism uh, in studying higher criticism and rejecting the Bible as truly an inspired Word of God um, and rejecting the idea that Jesus is the Son of God, um, as many of my liberal friends have done. Um, simply because they couldn't, you know, intellectually accept things in the Bible from their research. But I looked down that slippery slope, and I didn't like was at the bottom. The bottom was reason, but no faith. And I couldn't let go of my faith. I had to hang on to my faith. Um, and so, to this day, I still cling to the Bible as truly the inspired and inerrant Word of God, that Jesus is the Son of God, he's my personal Savior, and that it's through his death on the cross, his sacrifice on the cross, that forgives my sins, and gives, gives, is an atonement for my sins. But that doesn't mean I understand everything in the Bible. And all that study, because I, I've said many times, I've spent the last 45 years studying the Bible in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, uh, in the biblical languages, a minimum of three to four hours a day. And since I started the Learning Channel, it's been eight hours, sometimes ten hours a day. I drive a disability bus, and every down bit of downtime I have, I'm, you know, I got my iPad with me, and I'm I'm researching things online, uh, out of a quest to understand. Um, because there's things I don't understand, and it seems like the more I study in the Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, the more things don't add up. And I just can't be one of those who say, okay, well, there's things we're not going to understand, so we just, you know, we just have to accept it. I've got to find, I've got to find an explanation. I have to find some reason behind all this. Uh, even if it is off the reservation, even if it is weird, strange. Uh, so 
I've kept these things to myself for over 50, for, yeah, for 45 years or more uh, since I began my study in biblical languages. Um, I, I've kept many of these conclusions to myself because they're just too far off the reservation. They don't jive with my evangelical and orthodox views. Um, and so I keep it to myself. It helps me lets me sleep at night saying, well, I've got an explanation. It may not jive with what the rest of my colleagues and those in mainstream Christianity would say, but for me, it works. Well, I've turned 70 years old, and after a lifetime of trying to get a ministry off the ground and a lifetime of trying to build a platform, I've been very unsuccessful at it. And um, my following is very small. I don't have a very big platform. Um, and at the age of 70 now, it's quite apparent I'm never going to have a mega ministry, a mega church, or anything like that. Um, it just wasn't in God's plan for me. And I just sense God is saying, okay, look, you're 70. You know, what difference does it make? You're not going to have that big ministry you were searching for, so you don't have to kiss the feet of all these denominational leaders, and you don't have to shine up to them anymore. Just be yourself and go ahead and share some of these things. Um, if anything, you're going to be honest with everyone. You're going to be honest about your doubts, your struggles, uh, how you really fought and fight to believe my word is really the true inspired word. Be honest with people and share with them how you reached an understanding that lets you sleep at night, no matter how wacky or kooky it is. So what I'm doing on my learning channel now, for those who are members, and you've seen the first two chapters this week, the third chapter is going out and is just as wacky, more wacky than ever, what you're going to find in that third chapter of our in-depth study. And for those who aren't members of uh, the learning channel, uh, then I'll just share with you briefly one little thing that's going to be in that third chapter uh, just to show you that old Kaya Bentora, he doesn't have the answers. Well, Kaya Bentora, he can think some kooky thoughts. Uh, in other words, you know, get the net, get the net. Old Kaya, he's finally snapped his cap. Uh, but, hey, it's an explanation that, well, I, I can feel satisfied with. I don't expect anybody else to believe these things. I don't believe, expect anybody else to follow this. Um, but let me just share with you one little thing that's bothered me for a long time. And the only reason I share that is because I shared it with my publisher, and it turns out he was thinking along the same thing. He'll probably hope he doesn't listen to this, and I'm revealing something he doesn't want to hear. Um, and so let me, let me just kind of share with you this. Genesis 18.2. Now, Abraham is sitting there in his tent. He lifts up his eyes. He looks, and lo, three men stood by him. And he saw them. And he ran to them from the tent door. Does that make any sense? They stood by him, and then he ran to them. What's that all about? Uh... You know, and I looked at it in the Hebrew and looked at it in the Hebrew, and I don't see any other way to translate it. These three men were standing right there by him, and yet he had to run to them. What was going on? I, I had no explanation. Well, I, I got an explanation, but you're not going to like it. And then it said he bowed himself to the ground. Why would he do that with just three men? And we say, well, there are angels. Well, the Talmud in Lava Maza 86b identifies these three men as Raphael, Michael, and Gabriel. We call them angels. The Talmud doesn't call them angels. It just calls them as messengers from God. Um, and probably a reason is good, because these are called not angels. The word angel is melech in the Hebrew. 
Melech has a wide range of meaning. And really, from what I study in Scripture, the only, the only time Melech is used for supernatural beings is when we call them angels. But generally, Melech is a reference to a king, a leader, or someone giving an announcement. A messenger is a Melech, a human being. Not only that, it, when it says men, it uses the word anesh. Now, the brown driver Briggs says the root word for Anesh is ish. Um, Davison, lexicon, says it's Anesh is the root word. It doesn't matter. We're not, we don't know the origin of that word. Um, but it's safe to assume it's one of those two root words, Anesh or Ish. But both words, both words speak of a human being, not a supernatural being. This has troubled me for many, many years. Who are these three men who talk with the Lord? Now listen, God is talking to these three men. In verse 16, And the men rose, the Aneshes, the human beings, natural man, three of them arose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. He had to show them how to find a way to Sodom. You think a supernatural angel would be able to find his way? Uh, and the Lord said, "Shall I hide?" And he, so he's obviously talking to these three men, uh, two of whom are going to go to Sodom. And the Lord said, "Shall I hide from Abraham that which I do?" He is consulting these three Aneshes, these three human beings. I don't understand that. If they're angelic beings, why would he consult them? Unless they're human beings, and God is saying from a human, natural standpoint, what's your opinion about this? I am not a human in a human body. That's going to come when I come in the form of Jesus Christ. But you, you're, you're human beings. What do you think? How do you think, Abraham? whether I should tell Abraham or not. Um, again, just reaffirming, these men are human. Now they go into Sodom. And what happens? Lot sees them, and from afar, and he falls down before them, bows himself before them. What about these human beings that causes them to show such respect? And not only that, you, when they finally bring, come into Sodom, people around there, some men around there got wind of the fact there are some pretty, you know, nice hunks in there. There's, you know, really desirable men in there. Let's go, let's go have a little fun. And so they go pounding on the door. And you know the story. And it says the angel, or the angel, they call them angels. Now, it does mention Melech at, in 191 when they said to Lot that they were delivering this message of destruction. And that's what's really peculiar because I showed you earlier, it was God saying, what I do. And then they said, we are going to bring that destruction. These men are going to bring it. Why would God use angels to bring a destruction? He could just snap his fingers and it happen. Well, now these people, men of Sodom, they're wanting to go in and have their way with these, you know, real hunks in there, these strikingly attractive men. They don't suspect that they're supernatural. They just think they're ordinary men, which, according to the Hebrew words, they were just ordinary men, albeit very attractive, unusually uh, attractive type men, the uh, cause such lustful desires in these other men and you know you know the whole story I'll send my daughters out and all that what really gets strange is lots is these two men reached out and uh, he reached out and caused blindness now what I couldn't understand is even when they were struck blind they still kept searching for the door. 
Why? If I was struck blind, I'd forget about anything other than my newfound disability. And yet it was like they totally ignored their disability. Suddenly being struck blind, losing their eyesight, and they were still struggling to find the door. What they hoped to do when they finally got the door, if they couldn't see, how are they going to find these men? Um, you look at that word for blindness in the Hebrew, and there is no understanding of the der derivation of that word. The word itself comes from a possible root, which has the idea of creating blinders, like uh, putting up a film, a screen, or block something that blocks your vision. What these angels probably did was create an optical illusion so that they, every time they reach out for the door, it's not there. What happened? What's going on here? Sort of like, uh, and I'll get back to this, a time distortion. If they were able to distort time, that, in such a way, they could see the door, but they couldn't grasp it because it existed just a second in the future. Ah, I'm playing into all my science. Yeah, I, I'm a great science fiction fan. Uh, so I got a lot of this going on. Um, well, now they leave. You know, uh, and this is, you get the picture when you hear the story and you see pictures. Lot and his family are running for all they're worth trying to get out of town and the town blows into flames, the fire and brimstone falling. That's not what happened. The Bible clearly says they were told to go to another city and take refuge there, to hunker down, and don't look back. Well, we know the story. Lot's wife looked back. Well, the word look in Hebrew, um, it's uh, the word look actually doesn't mean taking a glance. It means to study, to contemplate, and to return. What could have very well happened was she snuck away because nothing was happening in Sodom, and she was on her way to return to Sodom. Or maybe slowly walking towards Sodom, contemplating whether to return or not, when it happened. And the Bible said she turned to a pillar of salt. Another word that we have no idea what the derivation is. The closest we've got on the root, wor root word is a word for a garrison, a military garrison, uh, a military post. How to get the idea of a pillar from that, I, I don't know. But it's the idea of a gathering of something. Uh, and then it says a pillar of salt, mecha. Now, that word, Naha, actually has the idea not only of salt, but of scattering. Because you know, what happens when you have salt in the air? It just scatters. It diffuses. It just goes everywhere. You take a handful of salt, there's such small particles. And, it, and so she became, and the closest I find with that word pillar is like send out. I really think that would be the true root word. To send out the scattering. In other words, she dissolved, disintegrated into like atoms. You ever see that in the science fiction thing, especially in Star Trek when they materialize and dematerialize? She dematerialized. Her atoms were scattered all over the place, diffused. That fits the Hebrew perfectly. And then it rained fire and brimstone. You know, something's unusual. you got a dead sea. I've always wondered about that. Why are there not other Dead Seas? Um, archaeologists looked at that. In fact, Oppenheimer, after he was a father of the atomic bomb, and he was speaking in the University of Rochester, lecturing, and a student asked him, are we really the first to create a nuclear weapon? And Oppenheimer said, well, as far as I know, yes. But, you know, archaeologists in a dig in the Middle East, they ran across like glass that had been formed from sand that could only be formed by extreme heat. A heat that 
to our knowledge, could only be generated by a nuclear explosion and the radiation that comes from it. Uh, but there has to be some other explanation because they didn't have nuclear weapons in those days or nuclear devices. So there just has to be some other explanation. Um, the creation of the Dead Sea would easily be explained through the detonation of a nuclear device 4,000 years ago. Um, you know, there is that evidence of radiation. Now, none of this is proof. There's a lot of radiation around. I mean, it's, it's not proof that there's atomic weapons. But, you know, I'm putting all this together. Wondering about these men coming. And in our in-depth study, and we'll go into the in-depth study more next week about the Garden of Eden, the word trees is est, which also means in the Hebrew a concentration of energy or a penetration. I'll explain more of that, but to my thinking, maybe those trees weren't real trees that we think of today, but they were actually concentrations of energies, stargates. See, I'm a great science fiction fan. And it says that Adam and Eve were commanded to multiply before their fall. How many years could have passed? The Bible is not clear as to how many years passed between their creation and their fall. We think it happened right away. But there's no indication it did. Could have happened thousands, maybe millions of years later because they had bodies that were not corruptible. Bodies that were meant to live forever until they sinned. And so any of their descent, any of their children who went on with the sentence and so forth, that they lived in the garden for over a thousand years, um, produced many offspring, they were all sinless. They didn't have that sinful nature. So what happened to them all? Could they have gone through some sort of stargate? Why would God create so many planets and star systems? Uh, and if you're a big science fiction fan, you know a stargate is like a wormhole that leads, you know, you could travel 100,000 light years in just an instant if you pass through this wormhole. Um, so is it possible that, and then of course, since, you know, Adam and Eve had sinned to pass on a sinful nature, that maybe, maybe these children all pass through these wormholes to go to other planets and start populating the other planets that God created. That he started his creation here on earth and then uh, expected it to, you know, expand out through the rest of the universe. Um, is that too difficult to accept? Maybe. Uh, but it does explain a lot of things for me that I don't find. Uh, explaining explains about this you know, fiery sword and angels swinging around his head and never made sense to me. But when I'm looking at it from a standpoint, using my science fiction, uh, you know, hobby, so to speak, and quantum physics, there's a good logical explanation coming out of this, which would mean that these three men were indeed men who... You can imagine, by the time of Abraham, if they lived from the time of Adam and Eve to the time of Abraham, without a sinful nature, they could have developed technology that would allow them to travel star systems and to come back to Earth and visit their kinfolk, their descendants. Um, and maybe these three men were visitors from another planet. We call them aliens. Uh, who really had their origins with Adam and Eve. And they had technology with them, technology to create a time distortion so that those men could grab hold of the door. And technology to set up a low-yield nuclear device, which really fits the picture of raining fire and brimstone and would explain why Lot's wife disintegrated um, do I believe all this? <laughs> well, let me just say, I've got to come up with some explanation for some of these things, and 
I'm happy with it. I, I can I can settle with it. Am I going to share it with anybody other than what I've shared with you here and my people on the Learning Channel? That's as far as it's going to go. Uh, I'm 70, of course, and it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I'm not trying to brown nose any denominational leaders. I'm, I'm beholden to no one. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to have some denominational leader calling me on carpet and defrocking me or anything like that. Um, I have the freedom to believe whatever I want to believe, and I can have a nice conscience that, well, in my mind, boy, this makes a lot of sense. It also satisfies my science fiction uh, enjoyment. And I've got a learning channel that I can share all these crazy things. You know, was it really? Did David really knock Goliath down with a stone in the forehead? Or did he just simply clap his hands and shout the name of God, causing Goliath to fall and then kill him, cutting his head off? Yeah, I'll be talking about that because, um, you know, reading it in the Hebrew, I could read it another way that makes a lot more sense for me. Um, you know, is there any harm in doing this? Well, you decide for yourself. You think old Kaim has finally snapped his cap. More power to you. Um, but I, I assure you, I remain true to my faith. Uh, the faith that I grew up in, I believe Jesus is... The Son of God, my salvation, that the Bible truly is the inspired Word of God. And it's a fact that the Bible, I believe, is the inspired Word of God that, you know, I, I want to find some good logical explanations from the Hebrew to explain some things. And if you don't like it, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I haven't left the reservation except for some of these things. And if you're really interested in more of the wacko, kooky stuff that old Kayim's coming up with, uh, you know, and you question where he got his bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. from, um, well, join us on our learning channel at HebrewWordStudy.com. Join up, and I'll be telling you, I'm writing a whole book on it, uh, and it's, there'll be a chapter every week put up on it. It's called The In-Depth Study. But for right now, uh, thank you for listening. Looks like i got a whole bunch of people listening. That scares the daylights out of me. I didn't expect as many people. That's why That's why I was doing it at this late hour. I figured nobody's going to listen now. Uh, boy, would I prove wrong on that one. But, you know, I am totally confident that I'm in the presence of God 24 hours a day. You know, as I've said many times, I wear this hat. Like a Jew wears a yarmulke. I'm not Jewish, so I don't wear a yarmulke, but I wear a cap. I always wear a cap, uh, even in church, if they'll let me. Uh, I don't wear the yarmulke because, you know, my Jewish friends would find it offensive, but I wear the cap for the same reason I wear the yarmulke, to remind myself that I'm always in the presence of God. And whatever I do, I do as unto God.